Hi everyone. So today we're going to look at three different artists who are all African American. All of their artwork has something to do with the experience of African Americans. And for my people who have a paper notebook, I'm going to ask today that you just write down the title of each artwork and then you can go back and fill in the identifiers. All the identifiers are available through the digital notebook online. So the first artwork we're going to look at is Horn Players by Jean-Michel Basquiat. It is from 1983, and it is acrylic and oil paint stick on three canvas panels. So for form, you can record that he used acrylic, which is a synthetic paint and oil paint stick. And this is the artwork we're gonna be looking at, Horn Players, and it's divided into three panels. So it's in a triptych format. And take a minute, just look at the painting, look at the words, what images are included. So uh, we're going to talk about this painting specifically, but I'll tell you that Basquiat is kind of a, a real popular artist right now. Um, these are some of his other works. So there's two symbols that are common in a lot of his works. One is the skull shape, which we see in the painting on the bottom. Another one is the crown. The crown has been appropriated for all kinds of things. Like I see it on t-shirts and different things. So we're going to start learning a little bit about his background. And so I'm going to show you a short video and you can record or think about context as you watch the video. How does an artist go from living on the street to selling paintings for $25,000 at 20 years old? Calling Madonna his girlfriend? Teaming up with the legendary Andy Warhol? tragically dying at only 27 in 1988, and yet sold a painting in 2017 at a price so high, it set a new record at auction for an American artist. Only one person I know, and that would be the legendary Jean-Michel Basquiat. Jean-Michel Basquiat was born in Brooklyn, New York in 1960. As you might have imagined by his unique name, Basquiat was the definition of multicultural. His father was from Haiti and mother of Puerto Rican descent, which meant by age 11, Basquiat was fluent in French, Spanish, and English. Basquiat seemed to be a quick learner, and by age four, he was able to read and write. He often created cartoon-inspired drawings with the encouragement of his mom, who had an interest in art. At age 7, in 1968, he was hit by a car while playing in the street. Not exactly the best pace to play. This left Basquiat spending a lot of time at home recuperating in bed. His mom bought him Gray's Anatomy drawing book to work from, which definitely influenced his future work. That same year, his parents separated, which meant his dad raised he and his sisters, which included a move to Puerto Rico for two years in 1974. After moving back to New York when Basquiat was 15, the pressure and stress of moving again mixed with his mom, who was now in a mental institution, finally got to him and he ran away from home. He spent a week sleeping on benches in Tompkins Square Park and after being arrested, was returned to his dad. Not long after, at age 17, he dropped out of high school and his dad kicked him out of the house. He moved to an alternative high school and supported himself by selling t-shirts and homemade postcards. By 1976, Basquiat and his friend Al Diaz began spray painting graffiti on buildings in Lower Manhattan, working under the name SAMO. SAMO, simply shortened for Same Old, was a creative way of calling out the predominantly white corporate and art world Basquiat wanted to break into. Basquiat had found a job at the unique clothing warehouse in the art department during the day and at night, continued to paint original graffiti. In 1980, he met Andy Warhol and presented samples of his work. 
Warhol was stunned by his mystique and allure. They end up collaborating on a film called Downtown 81, which included music from Basquiat, who was also a musician. Basquiat's breakthrough happened this same year in June, where he participated in the Times Square Show, a multi-artist exhibition where he was noticed by various critics and curators. One was Emilio Mazzoli, an Italian gallery owner who liked Basquiat so much, he invited him to have his first solo show in Modena, Italy, which included many painted pieces on found objects like doors. By 1983, he was now painting in a studio in Venice, California, having gallery events and showing up to those events with his girlfriend, who you might have heard of, Madonna. A friend of Basquiat said he would introduce her by saying, this is my girlfriend, her name is Madonna, she's going to be huge. Yeah, that was a pretty accurate statement. At this time, heads and skulls appeared in a lot of his works. Spurred by the neo-expressionist art boom, Basquiat's work was in great demand. Neo-expressionism referred to a new, rough style of creating and expressing yourself. It gave a nod to artists like Jackson Pollock, but Basquiat's work included recognizable subjects mixed with abstract ideas. By February 10th, 1985, Basquiat appeared on the cover of the New York Times Magazine. This was unprecedented for any young African-American artist and definitely put Basquiat and his work in the spotlight. Okay. So I'm gonna review with you a little bit of context um, that they mentioned in the video. So he started as a graffiti artist he and a friend created a persona they called Samo, and they made graffiti around New York City. He was not trained as an artist, so he's self-taught, but he was heavily influenced by previous artists like uh, Picasso and the abstract expressionist. So abstract expressionist uh, like Jackson Pollock, we learned in this class about Willem de Kooning, Helen Frankenthaler, and his career really took off around the age of 20. He's part of the neo-expressionist movement. So we talked about expressionism. We learned about Woman One by Willem de Kooning, The Bay by Helen Frankenthaler. We didn't learn about Jackson Pollock, but I told you about him. He did like the splatter painting. Um, one of the things neo-expressionists are reacting to is the minimalism and total abstraction of art. So think about like Mondrian, how it's totally abstracted into just uh, squares and primary colors. So they're reacting to that. And in his art, he has recognizable figures, but in an abstracted and often emotional way. So there are things that look very abstract, but there's also recognizable figures. Um, and it often looks very raw, which his artwork definitely does. It has like that graffiti feel to it. And just a reminder that whenever I put something up on a slide like this, those slides are also on Schoology under uh, the Unit 10 slideshow if, you, if I go too fast or you want to pull them up. Okay, so I'm gonna go to the image of this artwork and we're gonna describe it for content. So here we have horn players. Again, you should record info under content. This is made in a triptych format, which it has the three panels uh, some people think that also references the tall buildings of New York City where he lived. So you can see like the three panels, almost like three skyscrapers. Another thing that's common in his art is a lot of words. And you can see on this artwork, there's a lot of words written. And some of them are even crossed out.
This artwork also has uh, wide blocks of white. And he's heavily influenced, he was a big fan of jazz music. And this artwork is heavily influenced by two real uh, jazz musicians. So the two musicians are right here, Charlie Parker, who's a real jazz musician and he's playing a saxophone. And then the other jazz musician over here playing the trumpet is Dizzy Gillespie. And we have the word uh, Dizzy and Gillespie kind of written here. So Dizzy and then Gillespie is G-I-L-L-E-S-P-I-E. G-I-L-L-E-S-P-I-E. And so they're both there with their instruments. You can see over here on Charlie Parker, it's almost like sound waves coming off of the saxophone. And we have like sound and hot pink and hot pink musical notes. It's like an action, like he's actively playing. Another thing that's included is uh, what are called scat words. Scat is S-C-A-T. Scat is like part of some jazz music where the musician just improvises like made up words and they kind of sing them along to the tune. So here it says, ooh, shadi, obi. So it's just like made up words that they kind of sing along to the jazz music. And <clears throat> improvisation is a big part of jazz, both like improvising the actual music itself and then improvising the scat words. And I think this painting has like an improvisational feel to it. Like it feels like it was maybe even done quickly and it has like that feeling that you might get from jazz music. Okay, down here is a word, it says ornithology. Ornithology is the study of birds. I'll give you a second to write that. Ornithology is the study of birds. And um, there's like a double meaning to that. So Charlie Parker was nicknamed the bird. And because of that nickname, he made a, like a song called Ornithology. So it's sort of like there's little hidden meanings that you have to be kind of like in the know about jazz culture or African-American culture to understand. Okay, two other words. Down here, it says pre, P-R-E-E. -E. Up here, it says chan, C-H-A-N. So pre and chan are Charlie Parker's daughter and wife. And this artwork uh, definitely shows that Basquiat was influenced by other artists. And I actually forgot to pull this up, so I'm gonna do my own improvising right now and Google another artwork that I wanted to compare it to. So I said that he was influenced by, um, by Picasso. One of Picasso's really famous artworks is The Three Musicians. It's not giving me a good picture. That's all right. Um, but The Three Musicians, you can see here, they're very abstracted. And we kind of have the three musicians, almost like three pillars. Um, and we kind of get that same feeling, I think, from this artwork, where they're kind of in like three pillars we have the musicians that are abstracted, but still recognizable. So it really shows that even though Basquiat wasn't a formally trained artist, he studied art. He was influenced by those that came before him. 
And so kind of a parallel, just like the jazz musicians improvise, he's like improvising or riffing off of other artists' work. And so the function for all of these um, contemporary artworks, it's very rare that the artist tells us like, this is the function. So we kind of have to infer, and I'm gonna tell you one function, but there could be many others. So I think a primary function here is it shows an appreciation for African-American culture and jazz. But like I said, there could be other functions as well. So major takeaways from the horn players, I would say, is that Basquiat was a graffiti artist. He grew up in New York. He's very influenced by the African-American culture in New York that is really a part of all of his paintings. And he's a neo-expressionist where he's building off of the previous expressionist style that it's very improvisational and it's really about like the act of creating art. It looks very raw. All right, so the next artwork we're going to look at is called Dancing in the Louvre from the series The French Connection, part one. The artist is uh, Faith Ringgold, and this one is from 1981. And for anybody who doesn't know, when it says in the title Dancing in the Louvre, the Louvre is the most probably famous art museum in the world. It's in Paris. It has a ton of really uh, impressive art. And so that's what uh, the title means. And then you can see it says acrylic on canvas, tie-dyed, pieced fabric border. So let me explain a little bit about the form. So Faith Ringgold does what she calls story quilts, and it can be hard to see here because it's a tiny print, but she makes this as like a real fabric quilt. So what she'll do is she will um, paint on a canvas. So like this is all painted and then she'll stitch it together like a real quilt is made. So like with a real quilt, you have the top layer, then you have a uh, material in between, which is called batting. That's what gives a quilt like its puffiness. And then you put a backing on it and you sew it together. And then you sew actually quilt it over top. That's where the lines come from. So um, on her quilt, she has the main center that canvas section that she's painted. Then she has written words. So all of her quilts have actual stories and text on them, which this one does. And then it says pieced border. So a lot of times on quilts, you have like different fabrics pieced together or stitched together. And you can see on the border, we have different fabrics pieced together. And so if you wanna describe for form what you see, we have an image of women and girls dancing in front of paintings. One of them I think is real recognizable here, the Mona Lisa. And I'm going to come back to this and talk about it in a little bit. So let's go to uh, context and I'm going to give you a little background and then I'm going to show you a short video about the artist. So why did Faith Ringgold choose quilting as her artistic medium is important. Um, it's directly tied to the experience of both women and African Americans in the United States. So quilting has a long history. It is associated with women's domestic work. It's also a collective community activity. So throughout history, women would come together and make quilts like all together like uh, a bunch of women would come together and make a quilt for like a specific family or a specific person but it was a very communal activity and that was important 
in maintaining friendships. They would also bring the young girls along with the mothers when they went to the uh, quilting. And so young girls through like hearing about the conversations and stuff would learn about their family, learn about their history, and they would also learn how to quilt. So it was like a way of uh, sharing community and also passing on traditions and skills. Quilts were also used in the Underground Railroad. So you might know the Underground Railroad from US history, um, which is the pathways that slaves took to escape from the South to the Northern areas. And quilts would be used for that. Like they might stitch things into quilts and hang them on a fence. And there were like kind of secret hidden symbols that would direct people where to go. And Faith Ringgold, she'll talk about this in the video, but she has worked as an artist to make the art world more inclusive of women and people of color. And her work definitely challenges the fine art world by using folk art techniques. So when we see folk art, that's like traditional art. Or remember when we studied a little while ago what they called primitive art in the West? That could be considered folk art, um, like traditional art, whereas fine art are like these grand paintings that we hang in a museum. So like Oath of Horatii is fine art, whereas quilting hasn't really been considered usually fine art. It's sort of like arts and crafts. And she's elevating it to the same level as fine art. So I'll give you a minute to finish. Remember that these slides are also online. So I'm going to show you a short video of Faith Ringgold talking about her own life and her own um, story, which will give us some context of uh, for her work. I remember when I was young and I would go into a gallery to show my work, the gallery dealer would look at my legs, but not my art. I was born during the Great Depression and I lived in Harlem. From the time I was a little kid, I always had my crayons and my, my father brought me my first easel. Uh, I had my paint. Who's Afraid of Aunt Jemima was my first story quilt. We know Aunt Jemima as this person on a pancake box. I rewrote Aunt Jemima's whole story. She becomes an entrepreneur and she's just fabulous in my story. They would call the guys inside to sit around the table to talk to the curators and to the directors. You understand? But not me. The museum will open up to African-American artists, but you won't be one of them because you're a woman. Okay, I got it. <laughs> well, I decided that I needed to get involved with women's issues. At the Whitney Museum in 1970, they have biennials there. They had very few women in any of them. The last one that they had, I believe it was like 2%, two women. I said, what percentage of women do we demand? So my daughter, she said, 50% women. You want 50% of the people in the Biennale to be women. You know, we'd blow our whistles. We had whistle, police whistles that we blew. We had eggs. I boiled mine and painted them black and put 50% on mine. It felt like we were doing something. 
and we were a part of the movement in America to equalize things. You can't sit around waiting for somebody else to say who you are. You need to write it and paint it and do it. That's where the art comes from. It's a visual image of who you are. That's the power of being an artist. gives you a pretty good view of who she is as an artist. And this was her first story quilt, which was Who's Afraid of Aunt Jemima. And you can see it has like the piece quilted squares together and then the text written in. So she's really about rewriting American African-American history to celebrate African-Americans and even um, like tell stories that are different than what actually happened, like what could have happened. So. Aunt Jemima, like she showed, uh, was the pancake and syrup brand. Um, Aunt Jemima, actually, I don't know if you know, but like in the last couple of years, they've renamed that brand because it has kind of racist uh, connotations to it. And so rather than Aunt Jemima being like a slave or a servant for a white person, she rewrote the whole history like she said, making Aunt Jemima an entrepreneur and like all these great things that happened to her. So she's kind of reimagining uh, the history of African-Americans. So let's go to content and look at our specific work here. So the artist creates story quilts. And this one is from her series called The French Collection, which tells like a whole story about these African-American characters living in Paris. So this one is a fictional story of a young black woman in Paris in the 20th century. And in the text of the different story quilts in this collection, we see that the main character, this young woman living in Paris, meets all these important artists, people of the art world, and also all these important people from Black history. So, for example, and I'll, I'll shift over here. So, for example, look at this bullet point right here. Um, the text describes her meeting important artists and Black women, people like Picasso, Matisse, Josephine Baker, Rosa Parks. And so Ringgold in her story quilts tries to rewrite the narrative of the past to include and celebrate the history of African Americans and things from her own life. And I'll give you a second, and then I'm going to go back to the image. And so this one, um, the main character has like a friend and then her daughter's with her at the Louvre, this really famous museum in Paris. And here's just a little snippet of the text. Marcia and her three little girls took me dancing at the Louvre. I thought I was taking them to see the Mona Lisa. You've never seen anything like this. Well, the French hadn't either. Never mind Leonardo da Vinci and Mona Lisa, Marcia and her three girls were the show. So they tell stories again of the African-American experience. Um, and I'll show you some other examples of her work. Here we have Vincent Van Gogh included this one I like too, because it shows the women actually quilting, which is so much a part of what her work is about. And like uh, the video said, she was raised in Harlem, which is in New York City. So she has a lot of um, images of that too, that relate to her upbringing in the city. 
This one, I think, is a beautiful example where you can see all the quilting and piece, pieces of different fabrics around the edges. Here's another example. So for function, Bringold celebrates black culture and important black people. She also is challenging like who's accepted in the art world. So she's challenging that the art world should be dominated by men. She's challenging that it should be dominated by white people. And I'll, I'll say the function again. So she celebrates black culture and important black people. She's challenging the male dominated, white dominated art world. So she's our second really great example today of an artist an African-American artist uh, communicating things about the African-American experience. All right, and our third artwork that we're gonna learn today is called Darky Town Rebellion. It is by the artist Kara Walker, who is still actively creating art and real active. Uh, this is from 2001 and it's cut paper and projection on a wall. Okay, so here's Darky Town Rebellion. And when we see like different images of it, sometimes the figures are in different places as it's exhibited in different places. Um, but you can still see all the same figures. So for form, she uses black silhouettes of human figures that are cut out and pasted on a wall. So black silhouettes of human figures cut out and pasted on a wall. And the silhouettes were a popular art form like back in the, well, for like centuries before this. Um, and so she's using like a traditional art form, but in a more modern way. And then we have these colors that are almost like psychedelic, like it's, it looks like the 1960s or something. And so it can be kind of uh, like disorienting because you have these black figures and when we start to examine the figures, there, it's like pretty serious stuff going on. And then also these just like really uh, bright colors. So I am going to, I think, go to context first. And share that with you. So, Kara Walker studies the historical representation of African Americans in visual culture. So she looks at how African Americans have been depicted in art and books and media from throughout history. And she also has done a lot of research of life in the South before and after the Civil War. So the events that she depicts are of her own imagination. So like the figures don't necessarily go to a specific person or a specific event, but they are representative, representative of what has happened to African-Americans through history. The title of this work, Darky Town Rebellion, comes from a picture in a book called American Primitive Painting. So remember that word primitive again and the kind of negative connotations of that. The image in the book is labeled Darky Town, which you can just imagine like Darky Town is representing black people. And so in this book, it has caricatures of black people. And I'm going to show you an example um, when we go back to the slides. But even like well into the 20th century, it was common in media to have caricatures of black people where they're kind of uh, like reduced to somebody who looks less than or like they're kind of cartoonish and uh, comical. And so her work reflects the untold stories of black people in America and their erasure from history. So through her research, she read a lot about uh, lynchings 
report, which was like killings of African Americans in the South. And a lot of them were kind of like tried to, people tried to kind of wipe it out of the history and like not document it. Whereas if a white person was murdered, well, of course there would be a lot of documentation and court cases and all of that. And so she tries to link the unknown black history or like the things that have been covered up or not documented and therefore lost to the unknown in the figures in her silhouettes. So the silhouettes we'll see, uh, like the silhouette itself is detailed, but by making it a silhouette and not filling it in, it leaves a lot of information out. And so there's definitely unknowns about her figures. It can be kind of ambiguous to look at. And like I said earlier, the silhouette is a historical art form that goes all the way back to the 1500s used in a modern way. And also, like I already said, this artwork is not a specific event, but it's inspired by real events. So I'll give you a minute to finish and I'll add this info to the slides that are posted online. So let's look at the image and we're gonna describe it for content. Um, this is an example, this is like a pretty famous example of one of those caricatures I talked about of black people that were real common in the South. And so some of the, you can see how this caricature, it has like a real exaggerated pose and movement and stuff. Um, sometimes the caricatures, they make them look almost like anim animal or animalistic. And so we'll see in her work some uh, influences of that. Okay, so let's describe it for content. We have a wall with many black silhouettes on it. And we don't, we're not going to describe every single figure, but we can just point out like some examples. So one of the things you can see is some of the figures have very exaggerated positions or facial features. So like, look at how exaggerated this person is. The children here, I feel like their bodies are uh, exaggerated forms. And then we have some really, some things that look like really gruesome. So this figure right here, has a severed limb. We can see the bone protruding out right here. But without more information, we're kind of like it makes us question what we know and what we believe. So she leaves things purposely a little bit ambiguous. Another thing that looks pretty gruesome over here, we have a woman and it's, it looks like she's wearing like a big uh, hoop skirt like people would have in the 1800s. And then there's a small figure on the ground and we don't know like if that's a child or what's happening, but she has this giant thing that looks, I don't, it almost looks like a plunger or like some kind of um, instrument. And like, is she attacking that small figure and like beating that small figure? Like, again, it's kind of ambiguous, but by leaving us without those extra details, we kind of have to search for meaning and we make our own assumptions. And that brings in our own stereotypes, which is on purpose, making us think about how we view the world. So for example, in this artwork, who do you assume is black and who do you assume is white? What do you assume about the people? And so we have to, we put our own assumptions on it and kind of confront our own stereotypes. And we have to decide what each figure is really doing. 
another thing that happens because this is projected. And so if we were to go see this in a gallery or a museum and walk into the room, we would our silhouette would probably be projected onto the wall too, depending on where we were standing. So it puts us, kind of makes us think even more about our relation to the figures and our experience compared to what the figures are experiencing. <clears throat> and then, like I said at the beginning, the other for part of this is it has this projection and it also has sound. The projection seems kind of, like I said, psychedelic or like from the 1960s. And so one of the things that that could reference is the civil rights movement, which was also part of the 1960s. So for the function, it forces the viewer to confront our own assumptions and stereotypes. So it, the viewer has to confront their own assumptions and stereotypes. And it also just makes us think about the brutalities um, that people endured during like the time of slavery and even after, especially in the Southern United States. And from the title, like Darky Town obviously refers to this, like I told you, this um, caricature of African Americans, and then it says Darky Town Rebellion. So it doesn't give us any more explanation, but we might think about slave rebellions, people rebelling against racism. So we, we it forces us to put like a lot of our own um, thoughts and assumptions on it. So that is the end of uh, those three artworks. This video will be posted online if you missed anything. Um, and if you need to go back and look at anything or do the identifiers, it's all under unit 10.